Hi, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery back again with more Robert Fortune. Last time we featured passages from his book, published in 1847, Three Years' Wanderings in the Northern Provinces of China. In the three chapters I read excerpts from, Fortune wrote of his first impressions of Hong Kong and Xiamen, as well as other places. I'd like to continue on today with further passages from this book of his travels and observations made between 1843 and 1846. The highlights of this episode include Fortune's experiences seeing the newly opened treaty ports of Ningbo and Shanghai. These two cities will serve more or less as the backdrop for the adventures he had in subsequent trips he made in the employ of the British East India Company. Fortune made three more trips to China after the success of this maiden voyage. And these later trips were made in 1849 and in 1853 when he worked as an undercover spy for the British East India Company and later on in 1861 when he went as a private citizen, not on any particular mission. Shanghai and Ningbo were two of the newly opened treaty ports that came out of the Treaty of Nanjing that ended the First Opium War. The passages in this episode act as a nice time capsule that offers us enjoyable first-hand accounts of descriptions of Ningbo and Shanghai in the time of the Daoguang Emperor. Although European and American smugglers had been trading up and down the coast for a hundred years, this was the first time trade was being carried out openly and under the law. Fortune, in addition to his remarks and observations about the land and the objects and structures he saw, gives us wonderful eyewitness accounts of mixing with the local Chinese inhabitants. They're quite a hoot sometimes. I think any Westerner who's been to China for an extended period could surely relate to some of the situations Robert Fortune found himself in. That's what's so great about this book and many others I have uh, queued up for future episodes to come. Even though these words are speaking to us direct from the 1800s, they still have relevance in our day. They still resonate. There was a time before the Silk Roads and the Age of Discovery where people didn't get around much because well, it wasn't so easy to pick up and go anywhere. So when it all started to happen, encounters began taking place where people from different lands were seeing each other for the first time. That's why I particularly like Robert Fortune's books. He was one of the first Europeans to go take a look-see when those five treaty ports were pried open for the first time. And like I said last time, he wasn't a bad writer. So today we're treated to a few gems as Fortune gives his first impressions of Zhou Shan, Ningbo, and Shanghai. I'm not reading the entire book, just parts of it. Being a botanist on a mission for the London Horticultural Society, later known as the Royal Horticultural Society, Fortune goes into quite a bit of detail about the flora and fauna of the places he visited. So I'm going to spare you all that. Interesting though it is. It's quite a contrast between the Shanghai of 1843 and today's incredible ultra-modern megalopolis with all its signature tall buildings and amazing infrastructure. Fortune provides us with a nice snapshot of those days, as well as Chinese attitudes towards foreigners, or at least his version of what he thought they thought. That good old European 19th century superiority bleeds right through many of the phrases he uses. Some may find his remarks distasteful. They certainly aren't appropriate in this day and age. But as a time capsule from the afterglow of the Treaty of Nanjing, post-Opium War years, I find them often hilarious that people actually said those things on the record. So anyway, I hope you enjoy this. I visited Ningbo for the first time in the autumn of 1843. It was a large town situated on the mainland, nearly west from the Zhou Shan group of islands on the east coast of China. It stands about 12 miles from the sea at the junction of two fine streams, which by their union form a noble river capable of being navigated by the larger vessels and junks. One of these branches runs from the west and the other from the south, meeting at Ningbo and over the latter, the Chinese have constructed a bridge of boats for the traffic with the suburbs on the opposite shore. 
This bridge is a most simple and ingenious contrivance, consisting of a number of large boats moored at equal distances across the river, forming the basis on which the upper woodwork rests, and enabling the hull to rise and fall to a certain extent with the tide. By this means, there is sufficient room under the bridge to allow fishing and passage boats to pass through at all times of the tide, providing it is not running too strong. At spring tides, the water rushes through these spaces between the boats with great velocity, and sometimes it is next to impossible to get through. The city itself is strongly fortified with high walls and ramparts about five miles round, and the space inside the walls is almost entirely filled with houses, in most parts densely crowded together. There are two or three very fine streets, finer indeed, and wider than those of any other Chinese town which I have visited. A good view of the city and the surrounding country, as far as the eye can reach, is obtained from the top of a pagoda about 130 feet high, having a staircase inside by which the top can be reached. This pagoda is named Tianfeng Ta, or the Temple of the Heavenly Winds. It is evidently very old, and like many others of the same kind, is in a state of decay. Whenever I visited this place, the Buddhist priests were always in attendance with their offerings of cake and tea, for which a small gratuity was expected. When I first landed at Ningbo, the British consul, Mr. Tom, had not arrived, and I was quite at a loss where to go, or to whom to apply for quarters. Leaving my boat and servant on the river, I strolled away into the city to reconnoiter, thinking that something might turn up which I could use for my advantage. I was soon surrounded by crowds of the natives, and amongst them some black guard boys who had been corrupted to a great extent by the troops during the war, but who luckily understood a little of the English language, and were able to be of essential service to me. They informed me that there was only one Hong Mao Ren, a term which they apply to all Western nations, already in the city, and immediately led the way to his quarters. When we arrived at the house, I was surprised to find a former acquaintance. He was an American medical missionary and was dressed a la chinoise, tale and all complete, but truth compels me to state that his dress was rather a ludicrous one. Afterwards, when my knowledge of the Chinese costume was more complete, I have often laughed when I thought of the figure the little doctor must have appeared in the eyes of the Chinese. The large flowing gown which he wore was almost too fine for a Mandarin, while the hat was one commonly worn by servants and coolies. The English reader, if he wishes to understand the strange sort of appearance the doctor presented, must imagine a London judge clothed in his fine black flowing gown and wearing the hat of a dustman. I recollect one evening after dark going out into one of the main streets, accompanied by the doctor, to see an offering which was there presented to the gods, and I soon found that he in his Chinese dress was a greater object of attention than I was in my English one. How the Chinese laughed and enjoyed the joke. I had obtained a room in the same house with my friend, who was visited daily by great numbers of the Chinese, and who, although not a very good Chinaman, was most zealous in the cause of medical missions. As the winter approached, the weather became extremely cold, and in December and January, the ice on the ponds and canals was of considerable thickness. The most attractive shops in the city now were the different clothing establishments, where all articles of wearing apparel were lined with skins of various kinds, many of them of the most costly description. The very poorest Chinese has always a warm jacket or cloak lined with sheepskin or padded with cotton for the winter, and they cannot imagine how the Europeans can exist with the thin clothing they generally go about in. When the weather was cold, I used to always wear a stout, warm greatcoat above my other dress, and yet the Chinese were continually feeling the thickness of my clothes and telling me that surely I must feel cold. Their mode of keeping themselves comfortable in winter differs entirely from ours. They rarely or never think of using fires in their rooms for this purpose, but as the cold increases, they just put on another jacket or two until they feel that the warmth of their bodies is not carried off faster than it is generated. As the raw, damp cold of morning gives way to the genial rays of noon, the upper coats are one by one thrown off until evening, when they are again put on. In the spring months, the upper garments are cast off by degrees, and when the summer arrives, the Chinese are found clad in thin dresses of cotton or in the grass cloth manufactured in the country. In the northern towns, the ladies sometimes use a small brass stove, 
like a little oval basket, having the lid grated to allow the charcoal to burn and the heat to escape. This they place upon their tables or on the floor for the purposes of warming the hands and feet. Nurses also carry these little stoves in their hands under the feet of the children. Such, however, is the thickness and warmth of their dresses that it is only in the coldest weather they require them. Little children in winter are so covered up that they look like bundles of clothes, nearly as broad as they are long. And when the padding is removed in warm weather, it is difficult to imagine that you see before you the same individuals. I never felt so cold in England as I did during this winter in the north of China. And yet, as may be seen from the chapter on temperature, the thermometer did not indicate a very low degree. The house in which I lived was so open that the wind rushed in at every crevice. The windows were large, not glazed as with us, but papered, and in many places, perfectly open. During the day, I got on very well, as I was always out and moving about from morning until dark. But the long evenings, with the wind whistling through the windows and blowing upon my candle, were dreary and cold enough. To vary the monotony of the scene, as well as to warm myself, I used frequently to take a stroll down the main street. The Chinese, as a nation, are great gamblers. Even the poorest of them cannot resist the temptation. And in this street, after nightfall, there used to be numerous stalls of oranges, sweetmeats, and trifling curiosities, at each of which there were dice of some kind and a wheel of fortune, surrounded by the Chinese in great numbers, trying their luck with a few copper cash and evincing, by their looks and language, the most intense interest in the stopping of the wheel or the throwing of the dice. Besides the shops already noticed for the sale of clothes and skins, there are many others worthy of our attention. There are a number of excellent silk shops and warehouses a little off the main street, which, like our old established houses at home, have but little external show to attract notice. Here, too, are large quantities of that beautiful northern embroidery, which is so admired by all who have had an opportunity of seeing it. It is entirely different from that commonly procured at Canton, and much more elaborate and expensive. A considerable demand for articles of dress, which would be fashionable in England, has induced the Chinese to get them made, and they are now exposed for sale in all the towns in the north frequented by the English. Ladies' aprons, scarfs, shawls, work bags, and many other articles made up in the English style and beautifully embroidered are the things most in demand. The Chinese estimate their celebrated jade stone very highly, and here there are numerous shops both for cutting it and exposing it for sale, carved into all those curious and fantastic forms for which this people are so well known. The process of cotton printing in its most simple and original form may be seen in most of the streets here, as well as in other towns in China. Rope making is carried on extensively in the suburbs near the river, and some strong cables and ropes for junks are made from the bracts of the palm, formerly noticed, and from the bark of the urticaceous plant, commonly called hemp by the English in the north of China. There are, of course, the usual quantity of curiosity shops containing bamboo ornaments carved into all possible forms, specimens of ancient porcelain, which are said to preserve flowers and fruit from decay for an unusual time, lacquered ware, and other ornaments brought by the junks from Japan, many beautifully carved rhinoceros horns, bronzes, and other articles to which the Chinese attach great importance, purchasing them at exorbitant rates, apparently far beyond their value. But what struck me as being most unique was a peculiar kind of furniture made and sold in a street generally called Furniture Street by foreigners who visit Ningbo. There were beds, chairs, tables, washing stands, cabinets, and presses, all peculiarly Chinese in their form, and beautifully inlaid with different kinds of wood and ivory, representing the people and customs of the country, and presenting, in fact, a series of pictures of China and the Chinese. Everyone who saw these things admired them, and, what was rather strange, they seemed peculiar to Ningbo, and are not met with at any other of the other five ports, not even Shanghai. As all this beautiful work is expensive, it is, of course, only used in the houses of the wealthy. There are some large 
banking establishments in Ningbo, having connection with all the other towns in the north. And it is here, therefore, that the value of money is regulated, the stocks rising and falling exactly as they do in England. There can be little doubt that it is a place of great wealth. There are a large number of retired merchants in the city and suburbs who have made their fortunes in early life and who now seek to enjoy themselves amid the luxuries and retirement of Ningbo. But these circumstances, unfortunately, do not fit it for a place of active foreign trade, and hence, although it is large, rich, and populous, our merchants find the northern port of Shanghai of far greater importance as regards the sale of European and American manufactures and the purchase of tea and silk, the staple productions of the country. And yet, judging from appearances, one would think that a considerable foreign trade might be carried on at Ningbo. As it is in itself, a large town is in the midst of a populous country and has excellent water communication with all parts of the empire. Time and the perseverance of our merchants will soon show whether this supposition is a correct one. Shanghai is the most northerly of the five ports at which foreigners are now permitted to trade with the Chinese. It is situated about 100 miles in a northwest direction from the island of Zhou Shan. The city stands on the bank of a fine river about 12 miles from the point where it joins the celebrated Yangtzejiang, or Child of the Ocean. The Shanghai River, as it is generally called by foreigners, is as wide at Shanghai as the Thames at London Bridge. Its main channel is deep and easily navigated when known, but the river abounds in long mud banks, dangerous to large foreign vessels unless they happen to go up with a fair wind and manage to get a good pilot on board at the entrance of the river. I visited this place for the first time at the end of 1843, as soon as the port was opened by Her Majesty's Consul, Captain Balfour, and took up my quarters in a kind of bank or government shroff establishment, in company with two or three gentlemen who were here for purposes of trade. As none of us carried a cooking establishment with us, our meals were necessarily of the roughest description, neither exactly Chinese nor English, but something between the two. Our bedrooms were miserably cold. Often in the mornings we would find ourselves drenched in bed with the rain, and if snow fell, it was blown through the windows and formed wreaths on the floor. Nevertheless, the excitement produced on our minds by everything around us kept us in excellent health and in good spirits, and we made light of many things which in other circumstances we might have considered as hardships. Whenever we moved out of the house... Hundreds of people crowded the streets and followed in our wake, as anxious to catch a glimpse of us as the crowds in London are to see the Queen. Every door and window was crammed with men, women, and children who gazed upon us with a kind of stupid wonder, as if we had been inhabitants of the moon and not the ordinary sons of earth. The children, more particularly, looked upon us with a kind of fear and dread, doubtless implanted in their young minds by their parents, who had less or more of the same feelings themselves. The name we bore, Guizhe, or Devil's Child, was also calculated to produce erroneous impressions, particularly on the minds of the young, and make them regard us with superstitious horror. In these times, it was quite common for us to hear such expressions as the following, The Devil's Children are coming, or Come and see a Devil's Child, and not infrequently, Guizhe was called out to us in derision. Several complaints were made of this conduct to the British Council by parties who believed it to be very bad policy at the first commencement of the trade to submit to any marks of contempt, however slight, and strong remonstrances were promptly made by him to the Daotai, or head Mandarin of Shanghai. This policy was the very best which could have been pursued with the Chinese authorities, and the consequence was that in a very short time the offensive appellation was rarely heard in the streets of Shanghai, and if some little urchin, remembering the lesson so early taught him, came out with it unawares, he was immediately rebuked by the respectable part of the bystanders. The following incident shows the kind of superstitious dread in which we were held by the inhabitants. A friend and myself were asked to a dinner given on board one of the vessels in the river, and as the cabin was much more comfortable than our chairless, fireless rooms on shore, we remained until nearly eleven o'clock. Not only are the gates of a Chinese town closed after dark, but all communication, even with the streets and the suburbs, is cut off by numerous gates and doors, which are fastened up about ten or eleven o'clock at night. This has doubtless been a very ancient custom to prevent any sudden surprise by an enemy or by the unruly populace themselves, and is still kept up in more peaceful times. 
When, therefore, we landed, we found all the gates in the suburbs closed and locked, and we had to pass through one at least before we could reach our quarters. Not a sound was heard. Every house was closed, and all that dense multitude which thronged the street by day had sunk into repose. How shall we get through, said my friend. Shake the gate, said I. Perhaps the noise will bring someone, or perchance, as it seems pretty old, it may give way. We took hold of the gate and gave it a good shake, calling out at the same time for someone to come and open it. The watchman's light was now seen coming towards us, and my friend again called out to him to make haste. At last, two men with their lanterns came up. In that dreamy state, which I have already noticed as a characteristic feature in the Chinese race, and muffled up with skins, as the night was very cold. They could not see distinctly who were on the other side of the door, and, as we mumbled a word or two of Chinese, they were put completely off their guard, and supposed we were benighted Chinamen. The bolts were drawn, the door opened, and behold, two of the dreaded red-haired race stood before them. I shall never forget their astonishment when they got their eyes upon us after the gate was opened, and whether they actually believed us to be beings of another world, or suppose we had another army at our back to take the city a second time, it is impossible to say. But quick as lightning, they both turned their backs and fled, leaving us to shut the gates or admit an army if we chose. We walked quietly home, and neither saw nor heard anything more of the bold guardians of the night. The city of Shanghai is surrounded with high walls and ramparts, built upon the same plan as all other Chinese fortifications of this kind. The circumference of the walls is about three and a half miles, and the greater part of the inside is densely studded with houses. The suburbs, particularly all along the side of the river, are very extensive. Although the gates of the city are closed soon after dark, the people are allowed to pass through afterwards on the payment of a few cash. When the gate is open to one, a whole crowd are ready to rush through along with them, the first only paying the cash. Such is the custom, so that if a poor man comes to the gate, he has only to wait until one richer than himself arrives, when, the fee being paid, they pass through together. Joss houses are met with in all directions, both in the city and suburbs. At certain parts on the ramparts, also, these temples are built and crowded with idols, where the natives come to burn incense, bow the knee, and engage in the other ceremonies of heathen idol worship. Fortune tellers and jugglers are also in great request, and reap a rich harvest by working upon the credulity of their countrymen. You meet these characters in all the streets and public squares in Shanghai, and... What is very strange, the sing-song or theatricals, of which the Chinese are particularly fond, are frequently exhibited in the temples. This is much opposed to our ideas of religion and propriety. But somehow or other, the customs of our celestial friends are in many instances directly opposed to ours. The streets are generally very narrow, and in the daytimes are crowded with people actively engaged in business. The merchandise, which is the most striking to a stranger walking through the streets, is the silk and embroidery, such as I formerly noticed at Ningbo. Cotton and cotton goods, porcelain, ready-made clothes of all kinds, beautifully lined with skins and fur, bamboo pipes six feet long and nicely arranged in the shops, pictures, bronzes, and numerous curiosity shops for the sale of carved bamboo ornaments, old pieces of porcelain, and things of that kind to which the Chinese attach great value. But articles of food form, of course, the most extensive trade of all, and it's sometimes a difficult matter to get through the streets for the immense quantities of fish, pork, fruit, and vegetables which crowd the stands in front of the shops. Besides the more common kinds of vegetables, the shepherd's purse and a kind of trefoil or clover are extensively used amongst the natives here, and really... These things, when properly cooked, more particularly the latter, are not bad. Dining rooms, tea houses, and baker's shops are met with at every step, from the poor man who carries his kitchen or bakehouse upon his back and beats upon a piece of bamboo to apprise the neighborhood of his presence, and whose whole establishment is not worth a dollar, to the most extensive tavern or tea garden crowded with hundreds of customers, for a few cash, 1000 or 1200 equal a dollar, a Chinese can dine in a sumptuous manner upon his rice, fish, vegetables, and tea. And I fully believe that in no country in the world is there less real misery and want than in China. The very beggars seem a kind of jolly crew and are kindly treated by the inhabitants. 
Shanghai is by far the most important station for foreign trade on the coast of China, and is consequently attracting a large share of public attention. No other town with which I am acquainted possesses such advantages. It is the great gate, the principal entrance, in fact, to the Chinese empire. In going up the river towards the town, a forest of masts meets the eye and shows at once that it is a place of vast native trade. Junks come here from all parts of the coast, not only from the southern provinces, but also from Shandong and Jingshu. There are also a considerable number annually from Singapore and the Malay Islands. The convenience of inland transit is also unrivaled in any part of the world. The country, being as it were the valley of the Yangtze Jiang, is one vast plain, intersected by many beautiful rivers, and these again joined and crossed by canals, many of them nearly natural, and others stupendous works of art. Owing to the level nature of the country, the tide ebbs and flows a great distance inland, thus assisting the natives in the transmission of their exports to Shanghai, or their imports to the most distant parts of the country. The port of Shanghai swarms with boats of all sizes, employed in this inland traffic, and the traveler continually meets them. He gets a glimpse of their sails over the land at every step of his progress in the interior. Since the port has been opened, these boats bring down large quantities of tea and silk to supply the wants of our merchants who have established themselves here and return loaded with the manufactures of Europe and America, which they have taken in exchange. Our plain cotton goods are most in demand amongst the Chinese because they could dye them in their own peculiar style and fit them for the tastes of the people. From what we know of the geographical nature of the country, there can be no doubt that all the green teas, and perhaps the greatest portion of the black, can be brought to Shanghai at less expense than they can be taken to Canton or any other southern towns, except perhaps Ningbo. And as the tea men incur less risk in taking their money home from the north, owing to the peaceable nature of the inhabitants, this will be another very great inducement to bring their teas to Shanghai. I am aware that people generally suppose the black tea districts to be nearer the port of Fuzhou than either Ningbo or Shanghai, but it must be recollected that very few of the black teas now imported to England are from the Bohe Hills, as these teas are considered coarser and much inferior in quality to other kinds which are from a very different country, much farther to the north and on the northern side of the Great Mountain Range. The large silk districts of northern China are close at hand, and there could be no doubt that a large proportion of that commodity in a raw state will be disposed of at Shanghai. Taking, therefore, all these facts into consideration, the proximity of Shanghai to the large towns of Hangzhou, Suzhou, and the ancient capital of Nanjing, the large native trade, the convenience of inland transit by means of rivers and canals, the fact that teas and silks can be brought here more readily than to Canton, and, lastly, viewing this place as an immense mart for our cotton manufacturers, which we already know it to be, there can be no doubt that in a few years it will not only rival Canton, but become a place of far greater importance. And when I add that the climate is healthy, the natives peaceable and foreign residents respected and allowed to walk and ride all over the country to any distance, not exceeding a day's journey, it will be acknowledged that, as a place to live at, it has many advantages over its southern rival. I have already said that this part of China is a complete network of rivers and canals. These were often most annoying to me in my travels over the country when I happened to get off the Emperor's Highway, a circumstance of no rare occurrence. I have often been obliged to press a boat into my service much against the will of the owners, more particularly when I visited this region for the first time because I was then unacquainted with the localities. And the Chinese always seemed to fear I might take or rob their boats if I succeeded in getting into them. Such were the opinions formed of foreigners at that time. One day, in particular, I had been a considerable distance inland to the westward of Shanghai, and on my return, by some means or other, I got off the beaten track, and in pursuing my way, as I supposed in the proper direction, I was brought up by a large and deep canal. About two miles from where I stood, I saw a bridge, and it was nearly dark. I made for it as fast as I could. Unluckily, however, just as I thought my difficulties were over, being within gunshot of the bridges... 
I was again stopped by another canal, which crossed the former one at right angles. I was now completely brought to a standstill, but in a few minutes I perceived a boat approaching, and a man tracking it on the same side as that on which we were. As soon as it came near, we called out to the men on board to pull the boat towards us and allow us to get across to the other side. They seemed much frightened, and after making the man who was tracking the boat come on board, they pulled her into the middle of the canal and then sculled away with all their might. They would soon have passed far beyond our reach and left us to feel our way in the dark or plunge through the deep, muddy canal. Necessity, they say, has no law. Call out to them, said I to my servant, that if they do not immediately stop, I will fire into the boat and kill the whole of them. And at the same moment, I fired one of my barrels a little way ahead. This was quite sufficient. They immediately came towards us and put us quickly over to the other side. I paid them for their trouble and desired them to be more civil to the next traveler they might meet in the same circumstances. They went off in high spirits, and we heard them laughing and joking about the adventure long after they had passed out of our sight. As an agricultural country, the plain of Shanghai is by far the richest which I have seen in China, and is perhaps unequaled by any district of like extent in the world. It is one vast, beautiful garden. The hills nearest to Shanghai are distant, about 30 miles. They have an isolated appearance in the extensive plain and are not more than two or 300 feet high. From their summit, on a clear day, I looked round in all directions and was only able to see some few hills, apparently having the same isolated character, far away on the horizon to the south. These, I have since ascertained, are near the Tartar city of Japu. All the rest of the country was a vast, level plain, without a mountain or a hill to break the monotony of the view. The soil is rich, deep loam, and produces heavy crops of wheat, barley, rice, and cotton, besides an immense quantity of green vegetable crops such as cabbages, turnips, yams, carrots, eggplants, cucumbers, and other articles of that kind which are grown in the vicinity of the city. The land, although level, is generally much higher than the valleys amongst the hills or the plain round Ningbo, and consequently it is well adapted for the cultivation of cotton, which is, in fact, the staple production of the district. Indeed, this is the great Nankin cotton country from which large quantities of that article are generally sent in junks to the north and south of China, as well as to the neighboring islands. Both the white kind and that called the yellow cotton, from which the yellow nankeen cloth is made, are produced in the district. The soil of this district is not only remarkably fertile, but agriculture seems more advanced and bears a greater resemblance to what it is at home than in any part of China which I have seen. One here meets with a farmyard containing stacks regularly built up and thatched in the same form and manner as we find them in England. The land, too, is ridged and furrowed in the same way, and were it not for plantations of bamboo and the long tails and general costume of the natives, a man might almost imagine himself on the banks of the Thames. A very considerable portion of the land in the vicinity of the town is occupied by the tombs of the dead. In all directions, large conical-shaped mounds meet the eye, overgrown with long grass, and in some instances planted with shrubs and flowers, the traveler here, as well as at Ningbo and Zhou Shan, constantly meets with coffins placed on the surface of the ground out in the fields, carefully thatched over with straw or mats to preserve them from the weather. Sometimes, though rarely, when the relatives are less careful than they generally are, I met coffins broken or crumbling to pieces with age, exposing the remains of the dead. I was most struck with the coffins of children, which I met with everywhere. These are raised from the ground on a few wooden posts and carefully thatched over to protect them from the weather, reminding the stranger that some parent, with feelings as tender and acute as his own, has been bereaved of a loved one whom he perhaps expected should cheer and support him in his declining years and whose remains he now carefully watches. Those in the higher ranks of life have generally a family burial place at a little distance from the town, planted with cypress and pine trees, with a temple and altar built to hold the josses or idols, and where the various religious ceremonies are performed. A man with his family is stationed there to protect the place and to burn candles and incense on certain high days. Others, again, are interred in what may be called public cemeteries, several of which I met with in the vicinity of Shanghai. 
These are large buildings, each containing a certain number of spacious halls or rooms, and having the coffins placed in rows around the sides. Whilst at Shanghai, I, with some other Europeans, had an invitation to go to the house of a Mandarin to see a theatrical performance, or sing-song, and to dine with him in Chinese style afterwards. Sedan chairs were sent to take us to his house, where we were introduced to a number of his friends, and, as the invariable custom is, tea was immediately handed round. Shortly afterwards, a servant came with a tray full of wet, warm towels, not unlike those generally used in kitchens at home, and presented one to each of us. At first, we could not conjecture what these were for, but on looking at our Chinese friends, we observed them rubbing their faces and hands with them, and, although not very agreeable to us, we immediately did the same. I afterwards found that this was a common custom amongst the Chinese, and I have often been much refreshed by it after a warm walk. In hot countries like China, this plan is much better and more conducive to health than either washing or bathing in cold water. While this was going on in the house, the players were getting everything ready in the large room where the performance was to take place. In a little while, one of them entered the room where we were, carrying in his hand several fine, long ivory cards, on which were written a number of the most popular plays of the day, any one of which the players were ready to perform at the command of our host and his friends. We were most politely consulted on the subject, which, as we did not know a single character of the language, and had the greatest difficulty in understanding what was said to us, was not of much use. Having at last fixed upon a particular piece for the evening's entertainment, we were all led into the theater. The room was large and nearly square, having a platform at the upper end for the actors and band and one of the sides being only separated from an open lane by a railing, so that the public might also have a view of the play. The center of the room was completely filled with guests, and from the roof hung a number of lanterns in the Chinese style. As it was early in the afternoon when the play commenced, the lanterns were not lighted, and the piece went on in daylight, the Chinese actors not excluding it as we do in our theaters in England. The play began with some pantomime-like feats, such as we see in English theaters at Christmas. This was succeeded by something which appeared to be very pathetic, judging from the language and gestures of the performers. All was gone through in a kind of opera style, the actors singing their parts with false voices. The feats of tumbling, which were now and then performed, were extremely dexterous and clever, and attracted our notice more than anything else, probably because they were best understood. The dresses of the actors were superb, and must have cost a large sum of money. There were no females amongst them, as it is not customary for them to act, but their places were supplied by men or boys, chosen from amongst those who are most lady-looking, and so well were their appearance and dresses arranged that it would have required a practiced eye to have detected the difference. The voices of the actors were not musical, at least to English ears, but the whole was in unison with the noisy gong and the wind instruments like bagpipes, which are in common use amongst the Chinese. In fact, noise seemed to be the thing which produced the greatest effect, and we certainly had enough of it. I was struck by the various figures made by the actors on the stage, intended, no doubt, to represent something like those scenes or pictures which are so much studied in our theaters at home. A quadrant seems to be a great favorite, and was constantly made by them in the different acts. They have no scenery to assist the delusion, only a simple screen, which is sometimes used to represent a room out of which some actor is to make his appearance. Fencing is much practiced and is perhaps the most curious part of these exhibitions. Each individual has two swords, which he swings about his head in the wildest manner, at the same time throwing his feet and legs about in a most fantastic way, as if they had as much to do in the business as the hands and arms. The exhibition, or play, lasted for three hours, and then we left the theater and retired into another room. While we were there, the servants were busily employed in rearranging the theater, which was now to be converted into a dining room. When all was ready, we were led in with great ceremony and placed in the principal seats of honor. We had now an opportunity of seeing the extent to which the Chinese carry their ceremony and politeness amongst themselves when they are about to be seated at a table. Our host and his friends were nearly a quarter of an hour before the whole of them were seated. Each one was pressing the most honorable seat upon his neighbor, who, in his turn, could not think of occupying such a distinguished place at the board. However, after a great deal of bowing and flattery, 
All was apparently arranged satisfactorily, and dinner commenced. The tables were now covered with a profusion of small dishes, which contained all the finest fruits and vegetables of the season, besides many of the most expensive kinds of soups, such as the celebrated bird's nest and others, many of which were excellent even to the palate of an Englishman. The servants were continually employed in removing the center dishes and replacing them by others of a different kind, until at last everyone seemed perfectly satisfied. Still, however, the ceremony of bringing in new dishes went on, and these were merely looked at and removed. Our maiden efforts with the chopsticks must have been a source of great amusement to our Chinese friends, but they were polite enough not to laugh at us and did everything in their power to assist us. The play was resumed again as soon as the dinner commenced and continued as briskly as ever. The, quote, lady actors at intervals came down from the platform and supplied the guests with different kinds of wines. During the entertainment, a piece of money was handed to each of the guests, which they were desired to leave as a present for the actors at the conclusion of the piece. When this was given them, the whole of the corps dramatique came round, and each made a most polite bow of acknowledgment and withdrew. Still, however, the dinner ceremonial went on. Hundreds of fresh dishes were brought in, and as many in their turn removed. The Chinese guests were sometimes smoking, sometimes eating, just as it seemed good to them, and uniformly praising everything which made its appearance on the table. We had now been three or four hours at table, and although the whole affair had been very amusing, we had had enough of it, and were beginning to tire. How long shall the dinner last, said I to a linguist who was placed next to me, and who had most politely explained everything which had occurred during the entertainment. Oh, he said, it will last for three or four hours longer, but if you want to go away, you may do so now. We were very glad to find that Chinese etiquette permitted us to withdraw and ordered our chairs, which were waiting in the courtyard, to receive us. Our host and his friends lighted us out with lanterns, and we took our departure in the same style in which we came. So ended my first Chinese dinner. Since then, such things have been no rarity, either in the palaces of the rich or in the cottages of the poor, and they have been even more frequent in the temples with the priests. That wasn't too bad, was it? I mentioned last episode that a lot of these books from the 18th and 19th century that I've run across use these mysterious spellings of Chinese words. You know, Thomas Francis Wade didn't come out with his Chinese romanization system until 1867, and the father-son team of Herbert and Lionel Giles didn't perfect Wade's work until 1912. So I'm left in a kind of a no-man's land with fortunes, random spellings of Chinese words. Take, for example, the Daotai. Fortune spells that T-A-O-U-T-A-E. I had the damnedest time trying to find out what is that and what is the pinyin equivalent so that I could pronounce it correctly. Quite a process. I can only say thank God for the Google and Baidu and my amazing powers of logic and deduction. And to further complicate the matters, I had never come across that term before, daltai. So this was a case of searching how to pronounce a word that I didn't even know what it meant. So in Fortune's Day... The Daltai was the top official in the treaty port area who had the unenviable job of being the decider as far as all the bitching and moaning carried out by the foreigners. You could tell easily from the tone of Fortune's writing that the man is as pushy and arrogant of a Westerner as they come. And he was probably no worse than the rest of the Hong Mao Ren, as they were called. Hong Mao Ren, that's a nice term. Red-haired man. A nice catch-all word to describe Western people, regardless of their hair color. And one other thing, not sure if you picked up on Fortune's offense at being called a guizhi, or any other pejorative term the Chinese gave to Westerners. He refers to guizhi as devil's child. Gui means ghost or devil. Zi means son, or in this case, a noun suffix. It was perfectly all right for Fortune to look down his nose and to call the locals Chinamen and to laugh at their unfamiliarity with Westerners or Western sensibilities. (laughs) Yeah, good old imperialism. I promise you lots more to come. You'll certainly hear it time and again, that Western privilege and snarky remarks from Fortune and others who scoff at the locals and their customs. I particularly get a kick out of Robert Fortune's remarks about trade and commerce. It's just starting to happen. 
foreign trade on a much grander scale than before. And Fortune doesn't disappoint in his remarks concerning the potential for British trade with China. And having been in this business myself for more than a quarter century and having worked with a firm in Ningbo for the past 15 of those years, listening to his description of the city as he saw it in 1843 is quite a thrill. And I know not everyone appreciates it, but I got a kick out of Fortune's analysis as to the merits of doing business in Shanghai versus Guangzhou, at least as it pertained to the tea and silk trade. And when he said back in the 1840s that Shanghai had a lot of potential as a place of commerce, he wasn't far off the mark. And again, I think I mentioned this already, Fortune keeps referring to his location as northern China. Ningbo and Shanghai were hardly in northern China. If he thought that place was cold, he's lucky he wasn't actually in northern China. In many, in fact, most of the volumes I have queued up, I have to say I'm just a sucker for these situations where east meets west, and I'm particularly interested and amused about Fortune's first impressions of encounters with Chinese culture, or in this case, Fortune's soiree at the uh, Mandarin's crib. His remarks about everything from the hot towel to the local opera are interesting. He definitely uh, wasn't a fan of Chinese opera. I think he made that clear. So next time we meet, I'll gather up a few more juicy passages out of his debut bestseller, published in 1847, and then we'll move on to his two books where he carried out his great feats of industrial espionage. All to come. As I mentioned last episode, there's a new documentary out from French directors Charles-Antoine de Rouve and Jérôme Schemla. It's called La Guerre du Tea, or Tea War. It's a beautiful film and tells Robert Fortune's story. It's from French production firm La Compagnie des Taxi Bruce. It just came out in November 2016 on Art TV in La France, so you should be able to stream it from their Vimeo channel soon or buy the DVD, your Humble narrator makes his French cinema debut in this very picture. Anyway, that's all I got for you this time. More yucks and vintage words from over a century ago coming in the next episode. Hey, what do you think? Two episodes in a row, the length falling shorter than how it's advertised in the show's title. Anyway, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from somewhere east of Hollywood, wishing you my very best and hoping... You'll consider sticking with the program for at least a few more times and that you'll join me next time for another entertaining episode of the China Vintage Hour. And let me say, I'm going to put the word hour in quotation marks. Oh, and did I say you can get this China Vintage Hour, the Chinese Sayings podcast, and the internationally award-winning China History podcast all at teacup.media? Well, you can. Teacup.media. Take care, everyone. See you next time.